Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, your love and your kindness towards us, your faithfulness through our unfaithfulness. Father God, we thank you for the day that you have allowed us uh, to be a part of again, Lord. The psalmist says in Psalm chapter three, I lay down asleep. I wake again for the Lord sustain me. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for being with us. I pray that you would be with us and speak to us through your word in this Bible study that we are having. Be with us as we are young kids who are just passionate about your word and want to hear from you through your word and who love you, want to serve you better. And I pray that you would speak through our speaker today, Aaron. And we pray all this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, yeah. So if you're not Aaron, I, I encourage you to Amen. meet yourself. All right, Aaron, bro, preach the word, bro. I love you, man. I love you too. All right, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, um, tonight's topic is finding comfort in the sovereignty of God. Um, and, you know, comfort is kind of, I feel like it's been distorted on Christian TikTok a little bit. You know, we hear all the time, whether it's from, never mind, I don't need, I don't need to name names, but you, you all know what I'm talking about. But, um, you know, we're told, you know, we shouldn't be living comfortable lives. We shouldn't want to be, um, we should be doing things that make us uncomfortable. But, you know, if there's absolutely nothing that's comforting in us, comforting us in our lives, then we'll, we'll just be in constant despair. And if we're, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's really hard to glorify God when there's no, there's nothing to comfort you in this time. The problem the problem does not lie in finding comfort in things. The issue is what we find comfort in. So if we find comfort in, in, in sin, that is not a good thing. The comfort, the comfort, not the comfort itself is not bad. It is what makes you comfortable. If we find comfort in praying to God and in, in, in reading the word, in going to church and having fellowship and communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is good comfort. It's good. It's wonderful thing to find comfort in, in the sovereignty of, of our Lord. So I'm going to ask you guys to turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter six. We're going to be reading um, verses 25 to 34. Just put your thumb up when you're there. Put your thumb up when you're there. Is everybody there? Everyone there? All right. So at verse 25, Jesus says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more, are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by being worried, can add a single hour to his life. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, Will he, not, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So if we, if we don't have to worry about tomorrow, why, why can Jesus say that? Jesus can confidently tell us that we don't have to worry about tomorrow because it says in, in Hebrews 1.3, 
I'll read the I'll read the whole verse for for context. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, his being the Father, and the exact representation of his nature, and he, and upholds all things by the word of his power. So if he is the one upholding all things by the word of his power, then surely we can trust what he has to say about us worrying about our lives. And in, in, in Colossians 1.17, Paul says he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Without Christ Jesus, without God holding these things together actively, everything besides the triune God would cease to exist. He is the one who gives us our comfort because he is in control of our lives. And, and this, this is a beautiful truth. This is a beautiful truth that he is in control of our lives and, and that he is working for our good. For what does it say? What does it say in Romans 8? Paul says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, it's, it's easy for, for modern day prosperity teachers to, to take verses like this and make it mean what they want. For the prosperity movement, they take the prosperity for, for those who are children of God and they distort it by looking at it through an earthly lens. But the, the truth is that children of God, we who are in Christ Jesus, will prosper more than Joel Osteen. We will prosper more than Kenneth Copeland. We will prosper more than Joseph Prince because we have the righteousness of Christ and the, the sacrifice made for our sins. He, he alone is what should give us comfort. We have the promise of eternal life. And, and, and Paul, since, since, this is, since this beautiful truth is, is revealed to us in scripture, Paul can then say in Romans 5, 3 to 5, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope and hope does not disappoint. We have a God that works together for the good of those who love him and the good that God knows in our, in our current situations may not always look like good to us. For what does God say in Isaiah 55? My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God knows what's best for us way more than we know what's best. So if something bad, something perceivably bad is happening to us in the, current, in the current situation we are in, just know that God is using that to better, to better your life in Christ Jesus. This, this is why James... James can so confidently say in chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be complete and lacking in nothing. This is the, the great paradox of the Christian life is that we can lose all things, yet it means that we are gaining everything in the process. We can be going through these various trials that in our current situation plagues us and, 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 and makes us hopeless. But we can consider it all joy. Why? Because our God works together for the good of those who love him. And it doesn't take, it doesn't take a genius to know this truth. What does the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter four, after this long period of time that, that 
it, I'll read from verse, uh, verse 32 to uh, 35. God says, and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. He's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. You will be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, who had, he had everything. His kingdom was large. The Babylonian kingdom was humongous. He was, they, they would have probably considered him the king of the world, how large this kingdom was. And God took that all away. And that caused Nebuchadnezzar to realize that who God is. He it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? We have a God who works everything after the counsel of his will as paul says in ephesians 1 11 a god who is working everything in his purposes and we rejoice in this because if god were not totally sovereign and we had the least bit of sovereignty us and our feebleness and our sinfulness and our imperfection we would cause everything to go out of control. If it were us, if it were us that in all things are held together instead of Christ, everything would fall apart. We are so feeble and, and accounted as nothing before him, as Nebuchadnezzar, even the pagan king, realized the sovereignty of God. And we, we can rejoice in this, as, as I said, he works everything after the counsel of his will. And what is his will for those who love him? To, in, to, to work for their good. And, and, it, and he, we, 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 we find comfort in this because we are God's children. He has adopted us. He is with the spirit of adoption. We received the Holy Spirit, not a spirit of fear but the spirit of adoption in which we eagerly wait for the redemption of our bodies. We have a God, as, as, as the, the psalmist says in, in Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth. We, we greatly rejoice that God is in control and that you are not. Praise the Lord for this glorious, glorious truth that he is, is sovereign over all things. And that um, Paul in Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We may want things. We may, we may see things and say, and, and say that, you know, this is what I really want. But it is not us who know what we need. It is God, our Father, who will provide for us. He will provide our every need. We will never be lacking when we are in Christ Jesus. Even if I, even if I lost everything, if I lost my family, if I lost the house, if I lost 
if I lost the clothes, if I lost my phone, if I lost education, I would be gaining all things in Christ Jesus because these trials produce endurance. Praise God that he is in control and that we are not. I'm going to ask Juliana to lead us out in prayer. Dear God, I just pray that you soften our hearts to um, Aaron's message. And I just pray that you just let it sink in. Let us rest in your un unconventional love and un just like, I can't even put it to words how amazing your love is, Lord, and that we can rejoice in our trials. We can rejoice even when we feel like dying. <laughs> Um, I just pray that you continue to, um, teach us this lesson. Um, I just pray that you continue to, um, lead us to only find comfort in you, Lord. Um, and thank you for bringing us all together today to hear about you, um, in Jesus name. I pray. Amen. Amen.